It is such a pleasure for us to host uh, Sanjeev Fernandez today. Sanjeev is a program coordinator and researcher for the Biodiversity and Wildlife Solutions Program at Resolve in Washington, DC. In his role, he develops and implements new technologies for wildlife protection, manages human wildlife coexistence projects, and applies data and spatial analysis to global conservation issues. His work focuses primarily on conservation technology, human wildlife conflict, anti-poaching, and habitat preservation. Sanjeev has an MSc in environmental science and policy and a BA in environmental science, both from, the Clark, from Clark University in the United States. So welcome Sanjeev uh, and over to you. Hi everyone. Um, and thank you so much for having me, uh, Zainab and WNPS. Um, it's a real honor to, to be talking to all of you today. I know there's a lot of people across Sri Lanka and some friends of mine from the US and Canada as well who've joined. So thanks to everyone from all over the world who's joined. I'm really excited to be talking to you guys today. Let me just get my uh, screen up. Make sure we can see it. All right, Oops, sorry, one second. Sorry about the tech difficulties. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, we just tested this. No earlier. worries, no worries at all. Uh, just a reminder to check those two boxes at the small boxes on your yeah. share screen. All right. Can everyone and you see? need to, uh, you, you need to go to display settings and swap to present view. How's this now? Good. No, we're still seeing present view. Okay. Try this again. Not a great start when I'm talking about technology and having tech issues. So sorry about that. There we go. I think we've solved it. Is this good? Yep, perfect. All right. Okay. So hi everyone. Yeah, I'm really pleased to be talking to everyone today about um, technological innovations for us to protect wildlife, forests, and people. Um, and thanks, Zainab, for the introduction. I'll give you kind of quickly a little bit more background about myself. So I am Sri Lankan, I'm from Sri Lanka, I grew up there for most of my life. And then about 10 years ago, moved to the United States for college or university. And I did my undergraduate degree in environmental science and then my master's in environmental science and policy, both at Clark University. Uh, while I was doing my studies, I had kind of the fortune to, uh, every summer I'd be back in Sri Lanka and try to work in conservation as much as possible with you know, tourism groups or local NGOs. And around my second year of college, I really got um, kind of exposed to the issue of human wildlife conflict. And I'd always kind of been more interested in um, kind of the ecology of animals and wanting to study leopards and elephants and their behavior. And then I started to realize just how severe of a problem human wildlife conflict was. And that if we uh, didn't, uh, start having solutions to help people coexist with, with wildlife, soon we might not have much left to study or to, to show for tourism. So my undergraduate and grad research focused on um, preventing human leopard conflict in Sri Lanka, trying out protective cattle enclosures to help prevent leopards from preying on livestock and therefore prevent retaliation killings. So that was kind of my background and working with communities on human wildlife coexistence issues. And then after finishing my master's, I joined Resolve, which is a Washington DC based nonprofit organization. We're a really small organization, but we work on environmental, social and public health issues. And so I specifically work for the Biodiversity and Wildlife Solutions Program. And what we do is, and I'm the program coordinator and the researcher, and what we do is we tackle kind of the biggest most pressing conservation problems of our time, which are the approaching extinction of endangered wildlife and threats to their habitat, especially tropical forests, uh, where many of these species reside. And uh, 
some of you may have heard of our work and others may not, but we kind of have three main, uh, main criteria, I suppose, uh, of or departments that we work in. And one is the science to support the case for protecting half the earth. So in 2019, we put out a global deal for nature paper and followed it up in 2020 with the global safety net. Um, these basically were talking about how current efforts for biodiversity conservation and efforts for climate change uh, were being pursued kind of in isolation and rather than being pursued together. Um, and really they're interdependent. So the Global Deal for Nature paper was talking about how we need a unified vision to really help combat climate change and, the, and uh, biodiversity conservation together. And the Global Safety Net, uh, we went a step further and actually provided a roadmap of how do we actually do this? What are the most important lands that are not protected either for biodiversity because they have rare species or intact mammal assemblages and what's important for climate. Second is we have the Quick Response Fund for Nature, which is basically a rapid response funding mechanism to save the last in homes of endangered species. So while a lot of other kind of organizations might take a long time to approve funding for land purchases, we're able to get funds around, turned around really quickly. So sometimes within a month, we'll get a proposal and fund it to um, you know, at least put a down payment on land to help it from being stopped, uh, being lost to development. And third is what I'm really gonna be talking about today is we develop and implement groundbreaking scalable conservation technology. And today I'll mostly be talking about, um, so I've given you a quick background of myself. I'll talk about the extinction crisis and um, you know the crises we're having with poaching, deforestation and human wildlife conflict and the limitations of current solutions to address those issues. Uh, then I'll give an overview of TrailGuard AI, uh, which is our technology. Um, talking about how the tech works and then how we can apply it to stop poaching, to stop illegal logging, and to um, stop human wildlife conflict. And then finally, we'll just talk about our next plans for scaling this um, to areas of interest and future innovations that are on the horizon. Then we'll have some time for question and answers. So um, we are so fortunate to live on this amazing planet that has such wonderful wildlife, but Unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, species, you know, we're losing at an alar alarming rate and a lot of iconic mammals are at risk of extinction within our lifetimes. So forest elephants in Central Africa could go extinct within 10 years um, if current rates of poaching continue. Um, we only have a thousand mountain gorillas remaining in the wild and lion populations have dropped by 70% in 50 years. So once plentiful across Africa, um, they've now really shrunk in their range and their sizes. And so, to save endangered species like this, we need to understand really what are the primary threats um, that they're facing. And so those are um, you know, poaching in the case of elephants, deforestation. So apes aren't really being poached as much, but are losing a lot of their habitat. Um, and then for lions, it's human wildlife conflict. So these are the three kind of main categories that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could just imagine a world where elephant families living in protected areas were left in peace, they didn't have to worry about poachers, where rhinos, their populations could recover and rebound without fear of being hunted down um, for their horns. Um, and if you know, we could preserve our beautiful tropical forests um, from illegal logging and you know, prevent illegal logging before it happens and before they're cut down. So the question might be is, you know, we have all these protected areas. We've got 15% of the Earth's land that are um, formally protected. But yet, in a lot of these places, we have poaching happening, we have deforestation, and we have human wildlife conflict happening on the edges. So even though these are protected areas, why have we not been able to, to stop some of these issues? And kind of the underlying problem is that most of these uh, reserves are really vast. Um, they're you know, big in size, they're remote, and they're understaffed. So um, they just have very limited range of forces and resources um, that are not sufficient to prevent poaching and human wildlife conflict before they occur. So um, the Serengeti, for example, Serengeti National Park, perhaps one of the most iconic uh, national parks in the world, has only 150 rangers um, to protect the area the size of Belgium. So you can't really imagine you know, a country like Belgium having only 150 police or law enforcement officers for the whole country. Um, and then you know, the Serengeti, there's much more challenges in terms of the environment than just a country might have. So um, really the question here is, 
how can we use technology to actually prevent uh, these issues before they happen? There have been investments into technologies like um, doing DNA analysis on ivory uh, before to find out where poached ivory is coming from, doing gunshot detection to, to basically pinpoint where shooting is happening. But in these cases, the animal is usually already dead or about to be dead. And so really the question is, how can we get ahead and actually prevent these issues before they happen? And again, you know, the Serengeti having 150 rangers is the best case scenario. A lot of parks, you know, maybe have a handful of rangers to protect a really vast area. So how can we leverage technology to, to help the people on the front lines, the rangers, the park protectors to, to do their jobs better? And it's unlikely that, you know, reserves and parks are going to be able to increase funding to hire a lot more people. So, so how can we actually make them more, these limited ranger forces more effective? So we've created uh, TrailGuard AI, and TrailGuard is an AI-powered end-to-end camera-based alert system to, to detect intruders before they commit crimes. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but just, uh, we think of it as a burglar alarm system for national parks or a security system for conservation areas is an easy way to, to think about it. Um, I'll explain briefly how it works, and I can actually show you one of the cameras myself. So the way TrailGuard works is it is a really small cryptic uh, camera, and we put them on trails that poachers are known to take or suspected to take. They, uh, it, because it's triggered by motion, like any camera trap will, once anything walks by, it'll take an image. So if it's a bird flying by or a deer or anything, it'll grab an image. The camera takes four pictures and it runs artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is, uh, it is a computer vision chip. So think of the camera having a brain. So just like as humans, you and I can differentiate between you know, a bird and a human or a deer and a human. We've trained this uh, computer vision chip to do the same thing. And so it knows to look for, in this case, humans as kind of the target object. So and it'll take a picture of anything that goes by. If it's a bird or waving vegetation, it'll just go back to sleep and it operates in this deep sleep mode until it's woken up by the motion sensor. But if it detects a person, which is what we're really trying to detect here, then it will send that image um, to the internet. So that can happen over GSM if you have cell service in your park. A lot of parks don't have good cell coverage, so we can use long range radio or LoRa. Um, or satellite networks to transmit those images. They go to, it goes to our server and then back down to uh, the park headquarters. Uh, in some places, they have domain awareness systems like Earth Ranger to manage their software, and they, they can go into that system. It can be a, you know, a text or email alert on your phone to the Ranger teams, to the park warden, the Ministry of Environment, whoever the designated parties are. But within, if there's cell coverage, you know, under a minute, you're getting that alert if it's um, there's using radio or satellite modems, it's a couple of minutes, but it's a near real time alert system to say, um, hey, we've got poachers, uh, potential intruders detected. Um, do we need to go send someone out? Um, and it's important that we send an image because, uh, you know, sometimes you want to know is it, you know, just uh, some, a cattle herder who's going back to get his cow into the reserve and maybe that's not worth sending out your rapid response team? Um, is it a heavily armed group of poachers and maybe you don't, you want to wait and call for backup rather than sending your rangers out there? So it helps create that situational awareness um, to help uh, protect the rangers on the front lines as well. And um, can you guys all see me? Okay, and the camera. So the way it works is again, this is the small camera, and we will have some images to show later. But there is a small uh, motion sensor that's up here. This is the uh, ambient light sensor. So, again, this has a really wide field of view, the motion sensor. If it realizes that uh, if it notices something that moves across, that wakes up the camera from its sleep mode. The ambient light sensor here it takes the, its light meter, it takes light reading of. Um, the environmental conditions and sets the exposure accordingly. Here we have the infrared illuminator. So because a lot of poaching happens at night, we need uh, to be able to basically see in the dark, but we don't want to have a flash go off because that would disclose the location of the camera. So this operates in the infrared spectrum above kind of the visible spectrum of uh, the human eye. And so it not allows us to see in the dark without disclosing the location of the camera. This is just an SD card slot holder, which holds you know, all the images and the software that float around the camera. And uh, this is the camera lens. So um, TrailGuard really, we have five 
key advantages that are lacking in current systems. Um, and these are, one, it's a really miniaturized camera, as you just saw, that prevents um, theft. Uh, we can offer connectivity anywhere, again, using cell networks if available, otherwise long-range radio or satellite. And we have embedded artificial intelligence. So again, this means that the artificial intelligence is running on the camera itself rather than on the cloud or in a server. Um, this also enables us to have long battery life and over time it reduces the cost and increases the efficiency uh, for part protection uh, strategies. Oops. So here's a comparison of kind of a traditional trail camera or camera trap that uh, some of you who study wildlife might know. So, um, and they're kind of big and bulky. They have to be chained to these trees because a lot of times uh, they're stolen, you know, 10 to 40% of camera traps are usually stolen in the first year. In the second image, by contrast, we have uh, three trail guard cameras and uh, you can see how much smaller and leaner and easier to hide they are. In that middle image, the one on the left is actually, so we camouflage these uh, cameras before we put them out into the field. So we roll them in liquid contact cement and use whatever the local detritus is. In East Africa, we use elephant dung, actually. It works really well to, to hide the cameras. And then in the third image, you see once it's put into vegetation and hidden, um, it's almost invisible and really hard to see. So this really small camera helps uh, prevent you know, cameras being vandalized and stolen. Um, here's an example. Um, there is actually a trail guard on this uh, tree or this set of bushes, I guess. Um, and this is in a park in East Africa. I'd give you guys a couple of seconds just to try to see if you can see uh, where the camera is. And again, if you're a poacher, you're walking by this, uh, you have maybe three to five seconds uh, to even notice this, tr this tree, if at all, while you're worried about buffaloes or hippos or running into other dangerous animals. Um, if you hadn't seen it, it's hidden just here where the circle is. Again, really, really uh, cryptic, easy to hide, um, and enables us to, uh, to detect poachers while going undetected. And the artificial intelligence model that runs on this camera to detect humans in this case, um, it's agnostic to the angle. And I'll go into a bit more later how we train these models, but it can work uh, you know, rather than just at ground level where usually camera traps are placed. These can be placed 15 feet high up in the tree, enabling further concealment, but they can still detect people from this kind of aerial angle. Um, really well. So that helps improve concealment and avoid, uh, avoid theft. Um, so here's just a few examples of uh, the AI working. This, these were in tests actually last year in a park in Africa. Uh, here we can detect you know, multiple humans in images at varying distances. There's people on vehicles uh, and you know it does a really, really accurate job of detecting the people as you can see. Uh, it doesn't detect the vehicle only detects the person. So it's, uh, as you can just see, it's really, really accurate, kind of phenomenal to have the AI. So um, also again, because most poaching happens at dark, we're able to see in the dark as well. So here's a few examples, just of the nighttime imagery. Um, and this one in the top left is a, is a good example where without the, the artificial intelligence actually sees better than the human eye is at first glance, it would be really hard for a human to even know that there was a person in here without the box around it. Um, and then we're able to enhance these images also on the server before we send them back to the end user um, uh, to give them a bit more clarity. But as you can see, even in the bottom left is without enhancements, it works really well to detect people at night. And this is our found one of our inventors, Steve Bullock, uh, who was testing in the United States. Um, so, Going into the AI again, that's kind of like the, the big, big advantage that sets us apart is being able to run this AI locally on the camera. So um, anyone who has used camera traps will know that um, you get a lot of kind of false triggers. So again, because anything that moves will trigger the camera. Um, if it's you've got a bush or leaves or just waving grass, you will get you know hundreds of pictures. So a lot of the times, like 80% of the images that you're getting in camera traps are just moving vegetation then maybe another 10% are species that you're not interested in. So say if you're looking for um, you know, humans or leopards, whatever you're looking for, um, you might be getting other animals that you're not interested in. And only usually five to 10% are kind of what you're really, really after. So it would be really costly for us to send every image to the server, um, both in terms of battery life and in terms of transmission costs. So 
by running kind of that AI on the camera itself that filters out all the noise or images of non-interest and only will transmit to you what you're interested in. Again, every image uh, gets saved to the SD card, so you can always go back and investigate things later, but for your actual real-time alerts, you're only getting values for, of, only getting images of the, what you're interested in for the anti-poaching case that is humans. So like I said, is that enables tremendous savings on battery life. So because we do all this filtering when conserving energy by only sending the important uh, or the images that are humans, we are able to have batteries last over three years in the field. Traditional camera traps last sometimes between one to three months. Some of the other top line um, cameras, especially if they send real-time alerts. So the Reconyx Hyperfire is one example that can actually work in places with cell connectivity, but there's no artificial intelligence. It'll send every image. So your email will be, you know, get hundreds of pictures of waving grass. But what this also means is the batteries will die in about a month and a half, and you have to, one, spend money to get replacement batteries, but also that's, you know, wasteful for resources environmentally, and your team has to go out and keep changing those batteries, and, you know, that might call attention to it. So um, having this AI also really helps to save on battery life and makes the system kind of almost auto autonomous. You can leave it in the field and three, you know, it'll last for three years rather than having to go out every couple of months to change the batteries. So what this does is uh, it enables Ranger teams to operate with you know, three to five times more efficiency. And so this is what I was saying earlier, because they're so understaffed and have limited resources, and it's unlikely that reserves can increase their budgets to hire a lot more Rangers. This technology helps them to, to be more effective. So rather than rangers patrolling kind of randomly and you know, poachers can uh, get a sense of how those patterns work and soon they learn to find ways around it that they know when the rangers are patrolling and so shifting from kind of random patrolling to what we call event triggered rapid response. So you have your smaller number of rangers but you're already having these cameras to monitor the access routes, the poaching trails that you know poachers are usually taking. And then your small ranger teams can be uh, you know, utilized better once they get an alert from these cameras saying, hey, there's an intruder here, then they go out and respond rather than having to randomly patrol a vast perimeter. That's, that's a little harder to do. And as I said before, again, sending the images of the intruders are really important because that helps decide if it's a threat or not, or what level of threat it is, and uh, helps improve the safety of these you know, brave people who are on the front lines protecting our, our wildlife. So um, Trail Guard AI is working now. Um, we're in seven parts in Africa. Here's just a couple of examples of um, intruders detected in the park in Africa. Um, again, we've hidden faces just for confidentiality, but this is just an example of some of the, the images that we're getting. Uh, here are some more kind of herders and rangers. We're not sharing actual pictures of poachers, again, due to confidentiality reasons. But as you can see, and we have the p-values here, which is what is the probability or the confidence level that this is a human. And so in most cases, these are over kind of 98% really high probabilities. Um, and then there's a couple of places in the bottom, like you'll see in K and L, um, where there's this human looking tree stump and a cow that were detected um, as humans in this case, but with a very low probability of, um, you know, 0.22 to so 22% or 20% for the cow. And the reason we do this is we set the probability value really low because we don't want to miss any poachers. Um, so at least in our initial testing, we were keeping it quite low, uh, but we realized that most of our humans that we're detecting are about 50% probability. So we can actually change that threshold to say, um, only transmit images where you detect a human with the confidence level of 50% or higher. So then uh, you wouldn't even get these, false, these few couple of false positives. But even at this 20% level, the camera is filtered out over 900 false triggers. So again, if you had a different camera that was sending everything, all those images would have been sent that would have eaten up the battery about three times over. So just shows how important it is to have that AI running. Um, and so right now, the places where we've deployed uh, Trail Guard are places that have good cell coverage. And again, if you have good cell connectivity in your park, um, like Yala National Block 1 has fairly um, it is it uh, is, it's really easy. You know, you just plug it in, it works out of the box. But as many of you will know, is a lot of protected areas, because they're so remote and also vast and have different terrain types, um, it's very rare that you will find a park that has really good um, cell coverage, especially in the places where you'd want to put cameras to detect poachers. So in those 
places where you're able to use long wave radio networks to um, hop to a place where there might be cell connectivity. So if there's connection maybe near the park boundary or in a village outside of it, we can use this radio connection to get to a gateway at a point outside the village, or maybe there's a high point in the park that has good cell reception. And so we can use that um, to transmit the image over radio to the gateway and then onto the internet. And places where there is no cell connectivity at all, we're able to use satellite modem and satellite networks to, to transmit these images. So um, here are two of the modems that we use, and we've got a partnership with Inmarsat um, and Galaxy One, who give us discounted pricing um, on these SAT modems and really affordable transmission rates. So, oops, sorry. And it's really easy to hide these. Again, here's a fake rock, and then under it, ta-da, here you've got a satellite modem with your receiver. They can also be put at more secure places like park headquarters, but here's just some examples of how we make this work uh, without connectivity. And again, using the lower, we can amortize the cost of one sat modem by using multiple cameras communicating over radio with one satellite gateway. It's getting a bit technical here, but if people have more questions on the connectivity side, I'm happy to answer those in the question and answer session later. So um, we have a really advanced camera, probably the most advanced, you know, end-to-end -end camera based alert system for conservation. So the question is how have we made, managed to make this happen? Again, Resolve is a really small NGO, about 25 people. Our conservation team is you know, five people. So how have we been able to get this far and uh, produce this amazing piece of technology? And the answer is through really strategic and amazing partnerships um, with leading technology companies. So Intel is, was our first and our biggest partner. And we use their Myriad 2 computer vision chips. That's what actually runs inside the camera and is kind of what we call the brain um, of this, uh, this camera that's able to say, OK, is there a person in this image or is there not? It can be trained to detect um, objects. Um, so Vidya is our software partner. And I should say Intel has provided over the last two to three years probably a million dollars worth of in-kind support. Um, just with all their engineers who've been helping us with various hardware and software issues and getting us to where we are now. So Vidya is our, is our software and AI partner and they create um, state-of-the-art AI algorithms to detect uh, humans for the anti-poaching case and later as you'll see for logging trucks and key wildlife species. Um, they use synthetic data to do it and so it's really cutting edge and I'll go into that a little bit later once we get into the human wildlife conflict section. As I said, in Mars Southern Galaxy One leading satellite um, communication providers who give us discounted pricing on uh, the sat modems through their philanthropy and really, really affordable transmission rates. And I should say that every image that we transmit, our camera compresses it to about 20 kilobytes, so to a really, really small image that it's able to send uh, quickly, especially over long range radio and sat modems. And by compressing it to such a small size, it makes it affordable also to send this, because if you're sending much larger files, it would be quite expensive. So, and then in places where there is cell connectivity, we have a partnership with Amnify, and they are a universal cellular provider. So what this means is, it's kind of like, think of like a roaming chip that works everywhere. So these are installed into the communication units of our camera, and um, they will automatically connect to the cell network that has the best connection uh, and transmit. So you don't have to get individual SIM cards, say Dialog or Mobitel, depending on where you are. This will work kind of with all of the partner providers in the local country. And so even if we move this from Sri Lanka to India, you wouldn't have to you know, open it up and take out the SIM card. It's the same SIM that works with whatever provider everywhere. So, um, and again, they also give us uh, really affordable pricing and discounted pricing to be able to transmit these alerts. So here's just a comparison of kind of trail guard versus some of the state-of-the-art camera traps. And I'll reiterate that trail guard is not a, just a camera trap. We are an end-to-end AI-powered AI um, alert system. So um, other kind of leading camera traps, they are big and bulky, as you'll see. They don't have artificial intelligence. They only work in areas with cell connectivity. And a lot of times, sometimes that's restricted only to the US and Canada. So not really the most usable in, in some Asian countries. Um, but they're prone to theft and vandalism. They have really short battery lives because they have no AI, whereas Trail Guard, as you can see, display to scale is much smaller, much leaner. And uh, you know we can work in places with GSM or without any connection at all. And so 
over time, this helps because there's a low risk of theft helps you um, preserve your investment over a much longer period of time. So um, it's, and we're available at a similar price point than, than the other cameras. So, because we want to make this as affordable for all the quirks that need it. So I've covered the anti-poaching use case uh, now, and that's, you know, initially Trail Guard was developed for um, anti-poaching because what our founder and inventor realized was he was studying elephants and elephant behavior in Central Africa. And he realized that actually all the trails that the elephants were using, poachers were using those same trails to kill elephants. So he said, you know, if only we had a camera on these trails, we could, uh, could stop the poaching before they kill. So with the same kind of idea, moving on to the next major threat, which is deforestation, illegal logging, um, currently, there's not really many solutions to prevent uh, this before it happens. Right now, deforestation is usually detected um, from satellite imagery, and by the time you've cleared enough land for it to be seen from space, uh, that's, uh, you know, the problem has already happened. So how can we leverage this technology? How can we use the same kind of system we've developed instead of detecting people? Can we detect logging trucks? Um, so we spoke to Savidia and we developed a logging truck detector. So these can be put on you know, access roads um, to national parks or even inside national parks that um, loggers may sneak in and use. And so again, we can hide these, it's the same camera system, hide these you know, up in the tree um, to be able to detect logging trucks. And kind of here's some examples. Um, but again, being able to put the camera Kind of high up in the tree and be able to detect at any angle is really advantageous because if it was at ground level it could be detected it could get covered with mud and dust and dirt so um, this is just kind of one example of you know how do we take the same technology and uh, apply it to prevent deforestation and then where i'm going to spend the kind of a lot more time talking about is our human wildlife conflict use case so um, for most of the big cats you know, leopards that we have in Sri Lanka, but also lions, tigers, snow leopards. For kind of most of the big cats, human wildlife conflict is the primary driver of population declines um, because they're preying on livestock and local communities who, you know, human population has expanded so much that we are now living in areas that were traditionally occupied by wildlife and we've encroached on their habitat. And so now um, these carnivores are preying on livestock of local communities occasionally and are being killed in retaliation or being persecuted, um, and that's causing really sharp population declines. Um, similarly for elephants, uh, in elephants raiding crops and uh, damaging uh, homes of local villagers is a, is a major issue. And uh, in Africa, poaching is kind of the biggest threat to elephants, and human elephant conflict is an issue, but not as big as poaching. But in Sri Lanka, because most of our elephants actually don't have tusks, only about 7% of the male elephants um, or two to 3% of the total population um, have tusks. We're not targeted as much for, uh, for poaching, but Sri Lanka does have probably the, the most intense and the most severe human elephant conflict in the world. Uh, you know, over 400 elephants dying uh, and 100 people dying last year, and these numbers kind of keep increasing every year. So while loving wildlife is easy, kind of living with them can be a challenge. And so how can we, we use technology to um, actually prevent these and get ahead of these issues? So currently what happens in a lot of countries is there's compensation schemes. Um, you know, there's some fencing built around cattle enclosures and farms, but um, you know, we're not really leveraging kind of all the advances in technology that we use in our day-to-day -day lives um, for, for wildlife protection. So, one solution that we've worked on at Resolve is a project called Lion Shield. And that's where you collar um, quote unquote problem animals, so like potentially a known a lion known to raid livestock. They have a radio collar that people also use to monitor their movements. But if they, uh, and then we put an alarm base station at the actual cattle enclosure. So what happens is if the lion or whatever other predator you want to collar with this, gets within a certain distance of the enclosure, it can trigger um, flashing lights and sirens and loud, um, loud alarms to scare, scare off the lions before they, before they kill. So um, we've, this has worked quite well in a couple of locations in Kenya. We've also done some trials in Uganda, but uh, the problem with coloring and 
if anyone who's worked, especially in Asia, knows that it's really difficult to get permits to color. Um, it's a bit easier in Africa, but still challenging. And in Asia, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, it's expensive. You need to find a vet. You need to find the right drugs, a uh, vet who's able to you know, know the right dosages. And uh, it's just an invasive procedure. It requires you having to actually um, tranquilize the animal, find the animal if you, you don't know where it is. And so it's uh, kind of ends up being a logistically and, co and costly operation. But also for you know, species like lions, where there's multiple individuals in the pride, you can't afford to collar every lion. Um, so if you know, a non collared lion goes in and makes a kill, then you might have communities being a bit upset of, okay, I thought we had a system in place to help this, but um, you know, we're still losing livestock. Or if you know, there's multiple predators in the ecosystem like lions and leopards, if you're only calling the lions, the leopards come in, um, you still have that same problem. So this solution has worked. It works well in places where there are a limited number of known quote unquote problem animals. Um, and uh, you kind of know where they are and you're able to monitor those. But um, we've also tried this for elephants um, in, in Kenya as well, but also with some lim limited success. And through this, we started to realize, okay, you know, it's, it's prohibitive to, be, you know, to collar every animal. We don't want to see every animal in the wild with a radio collar either. So could we have a non-invasive way to you know, monitor these, these animals and stop, thing, stop these conflicts before they happen? So we thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could have a camera that would detect all these animals and when they're leaving the protected areas or before they're getting into villages, we're able to send an early warning system to villagers. And so again, using the same, same camera system, same hardware, um, but just changing the software, we developed what we call Wild Eyes AI. And so the you know, trail guard AI is the anti-poaching uh, use case. Uh, it's the same hardware for logging trucks, which we call Forest Guard AI, and now the one for Protect Wildlife is Wild Eyes AI. So, um, so we began training models to actually detect, let's start with elephants in this case, and our partners, Stividia, what they do is it's amazing. It's really cutting edge. They work with synthetic data. And the way you usually train a model, an artificial intelligence model, is you need tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images um, to train a model on something. So if you're doing it for cars, for example, you would feed it you know, hundreds of thousands of images of cars until it can act accurately detect one. But for elephants or other rare species, it's really difficult to find that many good images um, to actually train your model and that could take a really long time. So what the video does is it's, it's genius. They use, uh, they simulate these conditions using 3D models, kind of like Pixar or um, Disney. And they'll put um, all these animals in you know, different lighting conditions, different environments, different angles, so that eventually you have a really robust model that is um, kind of, a, that works regardless of the angle of detection of the, background. And so I'll just show you a quick video as well, in addition to these screenshots of uh, how they train that model. So again, yeah, so the, you see the camera panning behind you know, vegetation, so it will figure out how if part of the elephant is occluded by um, a plant or a tree, it's still able to detect it. So, um, just really cool cutting edge, um, you know, it looks like a video game or a Disney movie, but that's how they train their models. So what happens then is once the model is trained, we validate that model on uh, and test it on actual images from the field. So digital photographs, um, camera type images. And so we, we keep doing this reiteratively. And when I say we, it's, it's really our partners, Nvidia, who are doing all this work. Um, until we're happy with the performance of, of the model. So here we can see, you know, it's detecting elephants at really high degrees of accuracy. Um, some of these images in, in the front, for example, in early versions, they only detected two of them. We kept retraining the model until all five were detected at a high confidence rate. Um, and again, um, if anyone who's put out camera traps has known, you might have lost one or two to elephants, as you can see in B and C, where they uh, aren't always fans of camera traps and might stomp them out. So, Again, being able to put up the camera 15 feet up in a tree away from the elephants uh, is really advantageous. So once we tested the model, we you know we know it works well. Then we said, okay, let's go field test it um, in um, in real life. And despite my jungle virtual background in Washington D.C., where I am now, we don't really have any elephants in the wild. But what we could do is we went to the National Zoo um, 
in DC and they have Asian elephants there and we tested out um, the software on elephants and it worked really, really well. So that's ready to, to deploy in the field, but that's just kind of an example of the process of how we train these models. So Sevilla has you know, done the same thing. They already had human detectors that they used for some of their other clients who um, you know, need human detection for security or other purposes. But for the logging truck detector or for different wildlife species, this is just an example of how they do it is you start with these 3D models, you um, train it in a variety of different angles, you validate it on actual images, you keep refining it until you get a really high degree of confidence, and then you test it um, in the real world, you know, use the data from that to get anything you've missed, and you keep refining that model until it's you know, at a level you're satisfied with. So how does this work in the wild? So same, same process as the, um, the trail guard AI anti-poaching solution is to take a picture of anything that goes by. Um, if it's a deer or a bird or you know, an animal you're not interested in, it'll go back to sleep and operate in deep sleep mode. But if you see an elephant, it will um, know, you know, and this happens within probably 200 milliseconds is it uh, does the artificial intelligence analysis of all four images that the camera takes every time it's triggered. Um, and says, is there an elephant in this? If it is, it'll send the image with the highest probability of having an elephant, um, again, over cell, LoRa, or satellite networks to our server, and then um, back down to the designated parties of the park headquarters. It could be your Department of Wildlife Conservation Ranger team who are stationed uh, near the villages. So in this sense, it's, um, you know, can this be an early warning system where you can uh, alert the park rangers, you could alert the local community saying, you know, elephants coming in the area, be vigilant. Uh, uh, you could, you know, have the park rangers go out and actually, um, you know, move the elephants away from the communities uh, when they go out there. Uh, actually, just a small tangent is in Tanzania, we have a program uh, where we've trained the Tanzania rangers how to use drones uh, to chase elephants out of national parks. And so elephants, despite their giant size, are have a fairly outsized fear of bees and the drone, mimics, I guess, sounds a lot like a swarm of bees. And so we don't really know why, but elephants are afraid of bees. And so we take advantage of that kind of natural fear. And there we've actually trained them to send out the drones um, and then shepherd the elephants kind of away from community areas and back into protected areas. So um, that also helps you know, save them rather than having them to go chase them in cars or on foot, um, which is dangerous gives them a safe distance and helps to, um, you know, shepherd the elephants back into to protected areas. Um, we can also link uh, wild eyes to additional deterrence. So like I showed you with Lion Shield, that kind of alarm base station, we can link it to, um, to lights and sirens. So maybe in places where there's fencing around croplands, if there are gaps in electric fences that are put up, um, we can uh, put up these solutions there, um, these systems, and you know, if an elephant gets within 100 meters, that could trigger flashing lights. Um, then if it gets closer, we could, uh, or it takes another image, we could also um, trigger sirens or you know, recorded shouting from local farmers, whatever audio deterrents tend to work best um, in, that, in that situation. So just some examples of how in a, it can also be used as, ideally it's an early warning system that can alert the park rangers and the, the communities but um, it can also be kind of a, at a specific point to trigger deterrence um, and scare away the elephants um, autonomously. So for wild eyes, we have now detected, um, we have detectors running for lions, tigers, snow leopards, bears, wolves, elephants, rhinos, um, all great apes and all the wild felids. So for now, again, talk has kind of been a bit more global in nature, but all with application to, to Sri Lanka, but for the human wildlife conflict side, um, talk about what, wild as AI means um, for applications in, in uh, to a Sri Lankan audience. And so we have this field, field detector running and the way that came about actually was we initially trained a lion detector and then we wanted to try to detect mountain lions. And we thought, you know, a mountain lion or a cougar um, kind of just looks like a really skinny, uh, skinny lion. So why don't we try the existing lion detector on mountain lion and see how it performs. And it performed quite well. And then we realized, you know, all felids have a pretty distinct uh, body shape. So we actually managed to train a felid detector that detects all 36 species of wild felids, ranging from the smallest rusty spotted cat all the way up to, you know, tigers and lions. So what this means is um, we can, we have a camera that can run artificial intelligence and recognize leopards. So here are a few examples, uh, just of, you know, different camera trap images we found um, on the web or different digital photographs. 
um, and it can detect leopards as fields with you know really really high confidence you know 1.0 which is 100% confidence or um, it works at night it can detect you know multiple individuals with this neighboring cub here um, and even black leopards or melanistic uh, leopards can be detected uh, quite well as felids too so what this means is for human wildlife conflict purposes these could be put um, you know um, in areas near where there are cattle enclosures and be linked to additional deterrence. If you are a researcher and you're studying leopards, rather than having to put your you know, camera out um, deep inside a national park and then come back three to six months later to, to see what images you got and scroll through kind of all the noise of moving vegetation and images of non-interest, um, you can actually get a real-time alert within a couple of minutes uh, once a leopard is seen and that will come you know, right, right to your computer. Um, and what this means also for research, for monitoring, is that rather than sometimes if cameras are stolen or vandalized, you're not only losing your camera and your investment in that camera, but all the data that's on it can also be lost. Whereas, um, again, Trail Guard is you know, very low risk of detection uh, because of its cryptic nature. But even if somehow you happen to lose it, um, you would still have some of your important data because that's already been sent to you in real time. So this really, um, has applications for preventing human wildlife conflict, but also can really revolutionize how we monitor wildlife. Um, similarly, for the smaller cats in Sri Lanka, we have fishing cats, jungle cats, and mostly spotted cats. Um, the field detector works just as well as them on them as it does on leopards or larger cats. So um, you know we can use this same model uh, to detect, detect you know all of them. So if you were interested in a study site that had multiple species. Uh, you could run one field detector and you'd get um, all these images in real time of what's a field and what's what's not. So getting close to wrapping up here, but um, where are we where are we now? So Trail Guard is now active in seven parks in Africa. And again, we because we started with the anti-poaching use case, Africa is where poaching tends to be most intense. So that's where uh, we started. We are in seven parks there, and our next goal now is to get to 30 parks in the next six months. Um, and we hope to be in 100 parks in the next uh, year and a half. So, and we've gotten you know, tremendous uh, demand for these technologies. We have uh, probably got over 100 inquiries from you know, 30 different countries of people who, who want to use this technology, which is you know, fantastic. And this is really just kind of through word of mouth, through a couple of you know, documentaries and uh, features that have been done on us, but without any really any targeted marketing. And so um, we have now moved production uh, to one of Intel's factories. Um, we've got one in China and one in the US. But uh, this is an example of kind of what the manufactured version will look like. And on the right, you have actually one of the samples that we got. So it looks a little bit more sleek um, um, and ergonomic than our current design that we hand built ourselves. But uh, we're hoping that uh, we should have a large number of these developed, uh, built by you know, the end of the year. We've been affected a little bit by supply chain uh, shortages that you know the whole electronics industry is working with, but uh, we will have, have you know hopefully 700 to 1,000 of these really soon, which will help us scale across. And then just a snippet going forward is um, the we're already kind of planning our next version. So we currently use Intel's Myriad 2 chip. Intel's come out with the Myriad X, the next version of their chip, which has six to eight times more processing power. Um, it also is much smaller and our new design can be much smaller as you can see it fits in the palm of your hand versus being just longer than your index finger. Um, but this higher processing power can increase us from three years in the field to even five years in the field, making it really kind of an autonomous system that you don't even need to touch or replace batteries for. Um, and there's increased versatility because we can run multiple AI models simultaneously. Right now, it's we are usually running just a human detector or just a logging detector or just you know, an elephant detector. There's a few cases where we can combine a few of them, but um, on the Myriad uh, X and Trailguard AIX, the next version, we can actually run several different models. So what this does is it opens up the same, you know, still the same hardware platforms. Think of it as Trailguard AI or Trailguard AIX in this case, uh, which is the next version. Um, it's the same piece of hardware, but it's just changing the software using the SD card to, we can, you know, in addition to anti-poaching, illegal logging, and uh, human wildlife conflict, um, we've got new use cases that are on the horizon of, can we detect boats? Because in tropical rainforests like uh, the Amazon or the Congo Basin, uh, 
the rivers are actually like the roads in those ecosystems. So that's where all the illegal activity takes place. So can we detect boats coming uh, upstream on rivers um, and send those alerts to the indigenous communities um, or you know park managers, depending who they are, but there's a lot of indigenous communities there who um, are being victims of illegal logging and uh, mining in their lands. Uh, we've also got um, thinking about detect, uh, building models for detecting endangered uh, marine species like sharks and rays and turtles, but we could deploy on fishing boats to prevent the bycatch of marine species and help uh, you know, certify sustainable seafood. And uh, for endemic island biogeography, we can detect uh, invasive species um, and help to stop the spread of invasive species before that happens. So again, just some quick examples is, you know, rather than at a poaching trail, we can have this um, in a tributary or a river um, and detect uh, boats and help protect indigenous homelands and tropical rainforest parks. Um, we can detect sharks, rays, and turtles um, to help uh, ocean conservation and prevent fisheries bycatch. Um, and we can, you know, cats, rats, and goats that are um, harming native endemic island bio, uh, biodiversity, we can also detect those and help get biosecurity officers to get there before they spread. So again, just a quick comparison to show, you know, your traditional camera trap versus trail guard AI that we have in the middle versus our next model that we're moving to. Um, and so you can just see how small they are. This is a US quarter, a small coin um, for scale. So, um, you know, what we're hoping to is, you know, there are, we're starting with kind of the parks that are most threatened with poaching, logging, mining, but there are over 80,000 parks um, in the world that are threatened by these issues. Um, tens of thousands of camera alert systems can be needed to protect uh, forests, um, tropical forests and temperate forests um, all over the world where logging is a major issue as well. Um, you know, over 300,000 trail cameras are sold per year. Um, and there's over a thousand islands worldwide that are threatened by non-native invasive species. So again, we can build one single hardware system and just change the software to address all of these use cases. So just to, to tie back into kind of our big grand picture is this global safety net paper that I mentioned at the start of our um, presentation was, this is kind of our big vision of how we would like to save life on earth. And the dark green are the existing protected areas and then the other colors are different areas that are important for biodiversity or climate that we wanna put under protection. But hopefully we see trail guard AI or whatever the variant is, a forest guard or wild eyes, being the ground sensor in all of these protected areas as we increase um, the coverage of protected areas across the world to help prevent poaching, to help uh, prevent logging, to monitor threat human wildlife conflict, but also to monitor as rhinos recover in these landscapes to get real time you know, notifications on um, how these populations are doing. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for, for listening to our presentation. This is um, just a quick overview of our team. Again, big thank you. None of this would be possible without our key tech partners, Intel, Cividia, NUSAT, uh, MNIFI, and Lexonis, who are our partners on the next version. And if you'd like to learn more, please visit our website or Facebook or Instagram pages, or you can contact me um, at this email. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed learning about some of the technologies that we've developed and are implementing. And uh, we you know, really hope um, as we scale to bring this to Asia and to, I'm really keen to bring this to Sri Lanka as well to, to help solve some of the pressing conservation problems we have. Um, thank you so much for, for your time and really looking forward to engaging with you in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay, for that fantastic and absolutely enthralling uh, talk. Uh, it's really fanc fascinating to see how technology is being utilized um, and developed for, for good in conservation uh, and been used to address some really, the most probably some of the biggest challenges from at a global level we have is poaching and uh, also human wildlife conflict you spoke a lot about the technology side of this and the deployment. So in terms of deploying this technology in the field, especially what y'all have done in Africa, do you have any stories you can share in terms of conservation success stories and outcomes that have arisen? Uh, is that something you would be able to elaborate on? Sure, yeah. Um, and uh, so initially we first piloted Trail Guard in 2017, 2018. Um, and this was kind of a 
before we had Intel on board, we were using very primitive artificial intelligence that wasn't actually, um, you know, very good. The technology has evolved, you know, leaps and bounds in the last last few years. But uh, we deployed uh, in a park in Africa. I I won't name it just for confidentiality, but um, we were able to detect kind of over fifty intruders. We helped arrest. Uh, poachers from over 30 poaching gangs, recovered thousands of kilograms of bushmeat, um, weapons, snares, vehicles um, that were used by poachers. And kind of importantly is, you know, a lot of the times some of the people who are doing the poaching um, are actually, you know, they're from the local communities, they're just looking to make uh, a little bit of money, feed themselves, but they're not really the kind of the drivers of this conflict there, you know, the illegal wildlife trade is a much more complex web, you know, run by syndicates like, you know, terror organizations and Janja Weed and Al Shabaab and other of these, you know, they're all the same players. So um, we were able to, you know, set up meetings uh, with middlemen in that and help kind of dismantle that uh, kind of illegal wildlife trade chain. So those are, you know, some of the, the big success stories. And so ideally it's, you know, we're stopping poachers before they kill, but in cases where, you know, they've already been caught, you know, red-handed and have, which means you can still, you know, set that up, try to set up big meetings and, uh, you know, get the guys who are higher up in those food chains and food, food web. Um, yeah, Did I, that, what was the second part of your question? No, in terms of uh, example and positive outcomes of it being deployed in the field, uh, I think you covered that, yeah. uh, and I understand that there are aspects uh, for confidentiality reasons that uh, it's not appropriate yeah. to be shared. Yeah, I, and I should do that. So pre pre pandemic, we were actually our model was we would go out there uh, to the sites, we would spend you know about a week to ten days, uh, actually deploying the technology, training the local partners on you know how to how to de deploy it, how to manage it, but. Uh, and then the pandemic hit, which, uh, you know, kind of at the time we were starting to get ready to deploy, you know, to these, you know, seven pilot sites. And so it presented this challenge for us of we had a technology that, you know, we were used to going in, we were familiar with, and we would be able to train people in. But now suddenly we couldn't travel, we couldn't have those face to face experiences. So we had to engineer this to be kind of out of the box um, and be able to ship technology and then do Zoom trainings and, you know, make instructional videos and guides. And so that kind of has been, was initially a challenge, but really kind of important for us because now we're at the stage where we can actually ship technology and just train people over Zoom. And that's, that's really gonna help us scale, um, you know, to the levels that we want to, because if we want to get to hundred parts in the next year and a half, there was no way that our, you know, small team of three to five people could go out to, to all those parks in, in that time frame. So I uh, presented that challenge, but yeah, I guess because the, Kind of some of the deployments that have happened in the last year have all happened virtually. Um, you know, there's obviously lots of challenges. Of sometimes when you're so familiar with the technology, kind of if you're there and able to tinker with it, you can fix something in two minutes. But someone who's you know using it for the first time, there's there's some challenges. You know, no matter how competent they are in terms of their IT knowledge or their technology knowledge. So um, that's kind of been a challenge. But yeah, I guess lesser um, real real <laughs> real time stories to share from the field in the last year because we just haven't been able to, to travel. In the circumstances. I guess one of the challenges of using this kind of technology, which is very powerful, you'd be also very cautious in terms of whose hands uh, this kind of tech goes into. Uh, so do you, I'm sure you guys have a system uh, of uh, checks uh, to avoid that scenario. And uh, I know you probably can't go into too much detail, but would you be able to give us a brief idea in terms of how you kind of uh, take care of in terms of when you deploy this technology and make sure it does not fall into the wrong hands? Yeah, definitely. You know, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I should say, so at least for the anti-poaching use cases, kind of our hypothesis is there are maybe 10 major trails in a park, uh, no matter how big the size is, um, where you know, there are 10 major trails where the majority, say 70 to 80% of the poaching is happening. So we target choke points on those trails. Um, so where people have to cross, you know, um, if it's a river crossing or due to terrain, there's certain places they have to funnel into. And so that's how we kind of target actually that deployment of where we want to put these cameras. But yeah, as you say, it's, you know, we, uh, it's, it's really sensitive in uh, a lot of parks. There is corruption where, you know, um, there's plenty of documented stories of rangers um, who kind of turned over and have helped funnel information to poachers. So our protocol is really, there's only 
three to four people in the park who really knew about it. It's going to be your head of law enforcement, your kind of IT specialist, maybe, um, and a driver who actually would go out and set out those cameras. So um, we keep that uh, information at kind of a very top level at you know, a few trusted individuals of who we actually um, work with to deploy this in the field. Um, we don't really broadcast that, hey, this system is coming to this park so that, you know, that coaches would know and that people would start to, to look for stuff and be on alert where, you know, it's operating a little bit behind the scenes, working with a small group of committed individuals. And uh, so when the alerts are sent to, we, we don't send a GPS location. It's just a unit number. Um, so it's a unit 654. And then whoever has the classified access will be able to access a special database where they say, okay, put in a passcode and you know that 654 is in this area where to send your rangers. But yeah, again, it's, you know, the precautions we take there are really just to have it limited to, you know, your head of law enforcement, your whoever is the head of your operations room who'll be directing the rangers and maybe one or two other people, but not broadcasting that information widely so that it could get into the wrong hands. Um, and in terms of, for us, of, that's actually inside the parks themselves. But, you know, it's uh, right now, this is not something you can just kind of buy on Amazon or online where, you know, nefarious actors <laughs> might be able to get their hands on it. Um, we talk to the groups uh, beforehand. We have a consultation. We, so we make sure that these are only going to folks that, um, that are committed conservationists and that we know and trust. Thank you. I also want to encourage the audience to send in some uh, questions and please do send these into the chat directly to me because then it'll be easier for me to put these questions across to Sanjeev. Sanjeev, uh, there've been some questions that have come in prior to the uh, session as well. And they're asking in terms of uh, what, are, what was the inspiration to get involved uh, because you studied uh, environmental science and from there, how did you make this shift to working in technology and though it's for conservation, uh, it's very tech-based work and how did you make that shift? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. And um, so, and like I said before, is you know, initially when I started off my journey in conservation, I'd always wanted to work with wildlife and in conservation. I was most interested in kind of studying leopards and elephants. I was also interested in the wildlife tourism side, but really kind of when I started working uh, around the Yala National Park buffer zone um, with uh, cinnamon hotels at the time, uh, I was working on this project to, um, to do uh, human leopard conflict prevention. And again, you know, I realized that you know, if these rates continue and people keep killing leopards or keep killing wildlife at this, this rate, we're not going to have much to study with. So I realized you know, um, we need to have preventative solutions to, um, to do that. But again, when I was working there, it was, we were building, just building a better fence, right? It was, can you build a fortified cattle enclosure rather, that rather than keeps cattle in but doesn't really keep predators out actually can actually keep the leopards out. So much more low tech, really just building a better fence, but the same idea of like, we need rather than addressing things after they happen is how can we actually prevent these from happening? Um, but I had, you know, kind of really no tech background. I'd done some GIS work and remote sensing, which was kind of the most tech stuff I'd done, but in terms of developing camera systems, you know, I hadn't really done much more than using camera traps. And then I came to Resolve and, um, you know, they were basically in that phase almost like a conservation tech startup working on all these really, really cool ideas. And so I came in again from a conservation background with, from a human wildlife conflict angle. Um, and then at that point, we were working, we had some, we still have some community based work where we build chili fences in Africa, uh, in Tanzania. But we were, at that point, we were using drones to help uh, move elephants out of croplands. And then Trail Guard was kind of in its inception and being developed. And um, so I've just been really fortunate to work with um, you know, Steve Gulick. He's an um, electrical engineer, computer scientist, inventor. So my uh, really went from having no tech background to uh, kind of getting crash courses in engineering <laughs> to help develop some of this stuff. But again, um, a lot of that tech work where lucky happens through Steve, who's our you know, chief technical officer, but also through our partners at Inmarsat, um, Intel, Savidia. So it's uh, been kind of, uh, understanding and knowing the tech enough to be able to liaise with all these partners and work together to create the, with these creative partnerships to create a total good. But uh, I would say I'm not a um, kind of a programming or a tech expert in that sense, but uh, it's you know, developed that expertise of how do we 
kind of build technology for conservation, you, it needs to be low power, it needs to be weather resistant, it needs to meet all these criteria because, you know, uh, the household electronics we use every day, you know, we can charge them, they don't really have to be weatherproof, all these things. And there's so many different considerations also for the connectivity. So um, definitely things that uh, I didn't have much background in, but just kind of learned on the job. But, um, you know, it's really, Fortunate and really exciting to be kind of working on some of these cutting edge things, which is you know where technology is moving. Thank you. Uh, I know you mentioned in the talk, and there have been some questions that have come as well relating to this: that animals, especially elephants, are notorious for destroying camera traps in the field, uh, and they're even picking up on the trail guard cameras and have destroyed a couple, I believe. Uh, have you all had yeah, any? No, we, we, we haven't. We haven't had any trail guard cameras destroyed by elephants. In our initial thing in 2017, actually, and so again, I should say these cameras here, they are um, basically like, you can drop them, you can put them in water, they can withstand all the rains. And so we once had um, an elephant shake a tree and the trail guard fall off, but everything still worked fine. So we've, um, you know, been, we've had encounters that haven't lost any cameras to them. But this was again in our previous version. Our new one is uh, again being able to put it at a high at a higher elevation and being able to have that kind of a way off the trail is also I think will help with uh, preventing any losses. So we haven't haven't lost any cameras. Have you all had any issues with the cameras being detected by humans in the field or concerns no, in terms um, of? We have yeah we haven't especially not with this new version. Uh, but even with the, with the older version too is. I think I showed that image earlier of just, um, you know, that um, kind of bush or that tree. And so we've had, you know, Kenya wildlife service rangers and um, different rangers. We tell them like, you know, there's a camera in these bushes, can you find them? And uh, sometimes people couldn't find them at all. Other times they took, you know, three to five minutes and they finally found them. And these are really sharp eyed, you know, rangers who know what to look for. And we told them it's kind of in this grove of trees. But again, if you are a poacher walking by, especially at night or even you know, the day, you're walking by something for a few seconds, you um, uh, are also worried about running into other problematic animals that could could uh, cause you injury or harm. Um, so yeah, we, we haven't had that issue at all yet. Um, our loss came again in the pre-AI deployment back in 2017. We uh, had a hyena get to one of the cameras. So we used to have, right now everything's kind of up in the tree. In the old version, we had a battery box that was hidden on the ground or buried in the ground. And what happened was a hyena actually came and uh, basically mounted off and <laughs> um, chewed on the battery box and the cable. And so the lesson there was two things. Was one is always wear kind of rubber gloves before you're touching things. We put that into our new protocol, but hyenas just have such a keen sense of smell that you know they were able to smell that and uh, were curious about it. But really secondly is we just engineered out that problem is you know we said, okay, um, we don't need a battery box to be down on the ground. We have the small communications unit and the battery co-located that are above the camera, higher up in the tree and, and away from these potential dangers. So these are, it's a good thing about, you know, you do pilot tests and um, iterative uh, kind of development because you learn from these deployments and then you can make your technology better and better um, for the end users in the field. There are quite a few questions coming in now. Uh, do you think in the future, the multiple camera system may be replaced with a single balloon or satellite, similar to what they use in war uh, to focus on the target? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Do you think in the future, the multiple camera system uh, may be replaced with a single balloon or a satellite system, similar to what they use in war to focus on a specific target? So I think they're drawing yeah. on drones no, and stuff. I think it's a good question. So I think, what I'm understanding from this is like kind of aerial surveillance, like could you have a drone or a big uh, kind of one giant camera that can survey a whole park? Um, the answer I think is, um, at least not in the near future, um, those technologies are also usually really, really expensive. You know, our you know, cameras, we're talking about six to $700. Those types of you know, solutions where you've got um, an aerial you know, fixed solution is you're talking you know, fifty thousand dollars or or more, you would need to use um, also because you know you'd have tree cover. You'd need to use um, you know thermal imaging or radar or other different, much more advanced sensor technologies. Uh, so I don't think that uh, that's going to happen anytime soon. But um, 
Yeah, so it's uh, you know there there are existing you know satellites or you know, aerial imagery that people use, but uh, I think there's still a lot of value for this ground sensor being able to actually detect people on trails. Whereas you know if they're hidden under the canopy, you're not going to be able to see them from from uh, from above. As you, as you know, human elephant conflict is, of course, uh, probably the greatest threat uh, to the survival of the elephant here in Sri Lanka. Uh, have you all thought of, I know you mentioned though, you all have used drones, uh, for example, to uh, try and keep elephants out of, uh, keep elephants out of crop raiding. But have you all thought of any other technologies or is there anything exciting you would be able to share with us, especially to address HEC issues, uh, because this is something that is so relevant in the Sri Lankan context, especially. Yeah, um, yeah, no, definitely. I think um, the the ways I kind of describe wild eyes, um, again, you know, we there are opportunities where you might be able to call your elephants and have some of those, you know, alarm base stations when they're getting around crop fields. But again, I think Coloring here is difficult, uh, it's invasive. And so what we'd love to have is, you know, implement these wild eyes AI cameras um, at, uh, in, in different, uh, different parks, um, in different kind of corridors where elephants are moving from, um, you know, protected areas into villages. I know it's a very complex dynamic, a lot of the elephant ranges outside protected areas. So it's, you know, some immediate questions are, do we know, are there places where we know where elephants take, you know, set routes to move from, you know, one place before they enter a village, can we put these cameras in those places to detect, to detect them and, you know, transmit those alerts to park rangers uh, who can go out and, you know, help intercept the elephants and move them back, or, you know, we can, you know, alert the villagers nearby so that uh, people are less likely to be harmed. Um, outside of the tech stuff, as I was saying, we have um, a community-based, uh, what we call Tembo Pili Pili, project, and that stands for Elephant Chile in Swahili. We are working in over seven sites bordering national parks in Tanzania, and that is teaching uh, um, farmers how to use uh, chili fences. So just think of uh, fences, but with cloths kind of doused in chili oil. And elephants, they don't like, uh, um, in addition to not liking bees, they don't like chili because it's they have really sensitive noses, so that's kind of like them being pepper sprayed. So if you um, can fence your farms with with chili fences, we have seen really good results there of uh, not having elephants go in and break fences and raid crops compared to you know traditional fencing. So that's kind of a community-based solution that we could look at um, as well. Um, I know Zainab has been involved in work with trying beehive fences, and I guess we found that the Sri Lankan bees just weren't as aggressive as the African bees. But it would be interesting to, to try that in Sri Lanka, and I'd you know be keen. I think at one point we were looking at trying to find donors to uh, to launch a pilot project. Um, I guess it's a little bit more rainy uh, than in Tanzania, so it might require more frequent reapplication of the chili. But I think that would be you know something really interesting to test. That's more low tech, but yeah, for kind of the more high tech stuff, I think you know these uh, these wild eyes AI cameras. Okay, we know we can detect cameras and transmit alerts instantly, or um, you know, trigger some kind of deterrent. So with that knowledge, how can we think creatively of different situations of, to prevent um, you know, elephant deaths before they go into villages? Is it, if we know places where they are crossing train tracks and getting hit by trains, can we put these solutions there? So um, the technology is there. Um, it's now, you know, um, we've solved the detection issue, we've solved the connection issue. So it's how do we uh, just, you know, implement that in the field in the right situations. This is another interesting question in terms of your uh, funding. Uh, in terms, of, because I guess uh, as a as a not for profit, you always you're always struggling for funds, right? Um, and in terms of fundraising, have you all thought of uh, commercializing the technology and deploying it in a non wildlife scenario? Or has it been deployed in a non wildlife scenario for security purposes, for general uh, security purposes? Yeah, no, these are these are excellent questions. So yeah, so. Uh, Resolve is a nonprofit organization, but we've actually set up um, Wildtech um, at Resolve as a, which is a social impact enterprise. So I think of it kind of like a B Corp like type thing. Um, and so the technology is patented, it's trademarked, and that IP intellectual property is owned by um, Wildtech at Resolve. So what we are, sorry about the square. Um, so. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, so the, the plan longer term is, yeah, so, so far we've kind of been operating on donor funds and uh, 
um, you know, on philanthropy. But going forward to make this sustainable is we're going to need to uh, kind of help make this pay for itself, right? So we've created this social impact enterprise where we would actually, you know, we sell these uh, these cameras again, trying to keep the costs uh, low so that they're affordable to to everyone. But we charge a small markup on these cameras that will, um, you know, help just the operations of the company to deal with shipping and logistics, but also keep uh, funding continuous R&D for like some of the other innovations that we have on the horizon that I talked about and just keep making the technology better and better and try to get it um, further and further, further out there. Um, so, and in yeah, we we're looking at a few places. There's a lot of interest uh, from kind of the mining sector um, for, you know, human safety. We've had a lot of interest from defense, I think, our answer so far has been, you know, we we you know don't want this to be used for border security. You know, we uh, there's a lot of you know defense technologies that's, that are out there, I'm sure. But you know, our goal is we want this to be used for wildlife and to save wildlife, and that's kind of our most pressing concern. That's our mission. That's our goal. But um, you know, there are certain situations that have come up with like the mining industry where we might be able to sell these systems at a at a higher price and help offset that cost and funnel more money back into conservation. So. Um, you know, we're sensitive, obviously, around the, the rights of, you know, detecting humans and there's, and, you know, privacy and security concerns, but um, there's a few places with, uh, you know, detecting, um, detecting kind of commercial, like mining type things where we are exploring to see if that's a model we want to, to adopt. Uh, I'm sure your challenges at the ground level, as you mentioned, would have uh, changed when it comes to implementation. But if you look at a time pre-COVID, what were the challenges in actually implementing uh, this sort of technology on the ground, uh, especially when you're engaging with uh, communities and local law enforcement officers and rangers? So the challenges? Um, that's a good question. I mean. In some ways, we the places that we pick for our pilot places are some of the places that are most kind of some of the challenges in general. It's really hard to bring a new technology somewhere and to try to get it to work, um, especially kind of when you're in the early developmental phases. That um, um, you know, you know, there are going to be things that don't work, especially you know, in early testing. It's you know, um, the AI might not work as well as it can or it, for some reason, the cell network is down, or some, you know, some inevitably <laughs> uh, something goes wrong, and so making sure that you're working with people who realize that you're kind of in the testing phase. Those are some of like the important points for us when we were in earlier stages, and so we ran into a few challenges where you know sometimes uh, people expected this to be an amazing out of the box technology. You know, when it was still a year into development, this is you know two three years ago. So. Um, I think we realize the lesson that is, you know, we want to pick partners who understand that this is, you know, a developmental process. They are excited about new technologies. They're committed to actually devoting their resources to it. They're not just going to have these cameras sitting on a the shelf. They're um, going to be out there actively working with us. So I think um, in some ways we helped get around it by being strategic about deciding where we were going to go. But um, I think, yeah, you know, there's, there's, you know, several challenges. One is, you know, we initially deployed in places where there was cell connectivity and uh, because that was just the easiest you know, thing to do, you start with the low hanging fruit. But a lot of parks that think they have good cell service, you get out there and they put it on a trail where you know, they claim to have cell service and then uh, turns out there isn't. Or maybe there's, you know, you can get one bar to try to make a call, but it's not enough to send a small image. Uh, so then you, know, you realize, okay, the solution isn't gonna work here and you need to, to adapt for, for different things. So again, we've, you know, try to engineer that out. We have a now GSM kind of survey tool to help um, people go to those sites before we actually ship and deploy to you know test does the GSM here actually work. So uh, we've learned a lot of lessons along those along those lines. But yeah, I think usually kind of it's uh, you know just friendliness to uh, developing tech and being able to just troubleshoot kind of on the go when you run into problems. Thank you. Um... I think we'll kind of wrap up the session uh, shortly after one final uh, question. Uh, what do you have planned uh, for the future and anything you can share with us in terms of maybe working in Sri Lanka in the future? Ideas sure, you yeah, have. Um, so yeah, in the future, I think, as I said, there's, you know, our immediate goal is so we've got kind of a hundred parks planned and that's in the next 18 months to try to get 
this technology from the seven parks right now to 100 parks. And so a lot of that will be for the anti-poaching use case, but also for illegal logging and for you know, human wildlife conflict is um, get these to the places that need them most because we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, a lot of these species, the, the clock is ticking. And so where really laser focused on you know, getting this production at scale uh, to build enough um, and again, that in itself is a whole science of moving from kind of hand-built prototypes and assembly to actually manufacturing a product. And so again, good, good learning curve for me, which where I had no background. So now is you know, getting that manufacturing, getting all these products in hand and working with these parks to get them from out there. Um, and then we, you know, simultaneously working on the next version, like I said, that's smaller and more powerful. Um, so we can get those out there as well. And then we're continuing, you know, like, the amazing thing is that, that we have the hardware and we have the basis for the for training the AI model. But it's, you know, if you decide, okay, I, I want a model to detect otters or something that we don't have, you know, we can put that together fairly quickly. And so, as these you know stories and more and more news about our work comes out, we get approached with lots of different questions of someone saying, hey, you know, I want to use this for wolves, and we're using it for wolves in Germany now, or you know, there's lots of different uh, kind of applications. The possibilities are, are kind of endless. Um, but yeah, I'd say our main focus now is just getting that deployment, getting it to scale to those 100 parks in the next 18 months and continue to work on um, our next version and new, new use cases. Um, in regards to Sri Lanka, I am really, really keen to, to have this. I know um, human wildlife conflict is a major issue, but we do have uh, poaching and illegal logging, maybe not to quite the extent of some of the places in Africa, but I think there's definitely you know, at least a use where we could try out a couple of these, these cameras. Uh, camera systems. So, yeah, I would be really keen to uh, you know work with the Department of Wildlife, Wildlife Conservation and any NGOs. I know Zainab, you and I have talked <laughs> at length of uh, trying to find ways to collaborate to, to help bring this to to Sri Lanka. So, just kind of where we are at now is you know we've built about 150 of these that we're you know ready to get out into a few parks, and then now we're waiting for the larger production run to come in. Uh, we can probably start taking orders for those or. Um, you know, started working with groups who are interested in mid-October, but it's probably going to be early, like January next year, by the time we start having enough inventory to actually get out there and ship. So, but yeah, looking forward, hopefully in the next, you know, six months, we can have a couple of these in some of our important parks in Sri Lanka to stop poaching, deforestation, and human wildlife conflict. Fantastic. And I'm certain the WNPS, uh, we at the WNPS, I absolutely would uh, love to push this and see what we can do and how we can come up and deploy these kind of technologies uh, to get effective conservation outcomes here in Sri Lanka. So thank you, Sanjay, for the, joining us today for this session, for engaging with us uh, on your work. Uh, you're doing some very inspiring work, and it's also fantastic to see a Sri Lankan uh, pioneering this kind of work. There's been a lot of positive comments and feedback that has come in uh, in the chat. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Great, thanks so much. And yeah, my contact information is there if anyone wants to reach out for further information. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to talk to all of you and thank you everyone for all your time. Really appreciate it.